When was it that we were here? Was it like November? And it was cold. It was cold. This is going to be a little bit nicer this time. We're back in Vigo County, Indiana, where last year we helped solve Erica Case's murder and put her killer, Clint Mackey, behind bars. I'll walk right over and I killed her. And I, I killed her. This week, we're hoping we can once again uncover the truth. Yo, this case is 39 years old. That is the oldest case we have ever done. It happened April the 2nd, 1975, to a 23-year-old girl. Our victim in this case, Kathy Taylor, was discovered dead by her husband, Earl. Apparently, he found her electrocuted in the bathtub after a radio had accidentally fallen into the water. While many people back then thought that Earl's actions were suspicious, the DA back then didn't think there was enough evidence to move forward, and the case went cold. This case is a little unusual. Uh, death by electrocution with a small little AM FM clock radio. Earl also told several people that Kathy had terminal cancer, which could make suicide a possibility also. Kathy Taylor's family have always believed that he murdered Kathy, and no matter how long it takes, they're just as ready as they were on day two to see him get justice. It's been 39 years. There's no physical evidence left to be tested and no DNA to find. But that's never stopped us before. We just have a little bathroom with a little bathtub, but there's a lot to say about what happened here. The question is, was Kathy's death an accident, a suicide, or did Earl kill her? And if so, can we find enough evidence to prove it? It has been 16 years and still no the answer. Police consider her killing a cold case. Years later, the case is still unsolved. There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. We feel like we're back home. Hey! Hey! So happy to see you guys. So happy to see you. Guys. So happy to see you. We were thrilled the first time the team was able to come here. Everybody adds a piece to the puzzle. Hopefully we'll be able to make lightning strike twice. You ready to show us our room? Let's go. Same Good. place, same Let's time. Do it. It's kind of fun to walk in on the first day and everybody knows how it works. Hey, how are you? Nice good. to see you again. How are you? Good. I'm glad wet, you're back. Wet. Yeah. Coming with us this week to work on this case is Steve Spingola from Wisconsin. Ready to go to work? You got it. Steve is excited because he already knows John and Derek. They bonded when they were working together to catch Clint Mackey. What a great team. This case is a 1975 case. How old were you in 1975? Um, were you born? I wasn't born in 1975. <laughs> I knew that was that's, coming. That's how old this case is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, y'all want to start with um, the beginning of the story on this case? Sure, sure. Earl Taylor and Kathy had been married for a little under two years. On April 2nd, Earl Taylor comes home, approximately 4.30 in the evening, and he finds Kathy lying in a tub of water, appears to be dead, and between her lower legs is a radio still plugged into the wall. Earl claims to then unplug the radio, take it out, drains the water, lifts her out of the tub, lays her on the floor, and covers her with a blanket. At that time, he calls his father. His father then drives to City Hall, where he asks the secretary of the mayor to call law enforcement, which she does. And John, back then, there was no 911, OK? Right. But the way he still reported it by going to his dad first, that's weird, right? We all want to start putting what we have and what we do know on the board? Might as well. Sure. OK. Earl Taylor. They've agreed already, apparently, to separate and divorce. In fact, Kathy goes to see a lawyer and make this final. According to Kathy's family and friends, she was looking to divorce Earl because he was messing around with a lot of other women, including a lady named Sue. Uh, the letter here to Earl from Sue, she's talking about how she wants to marry him. And this letter was dated November 13th, 1973. Uh, Earl and Kathy had just been married in uh, late October of 1973. Hey, Y'all want to talk about insurance now? Oh, yeah, the big motivator. Earl had several small life insurance policies on Kathy, but Earl was an insurance salesman. And every insurance salesman we've ever met says you can't have too much. He might stand to gain right under $100,000. I thought that some of them were double if it was an accident. Accidental That's death. the way it added up to more money. Conservatively, then. Let's right? say conservatively, right mm -hmm. under $100,000, he's thinking he might benefit by getting rid of her. Right. Then why did he go around telling people she had cancer?
cancer. It's a good question. Before she died, Earl told some people that Kathy had terminal cancer, leading them to infer that she might have committed suicide because of the disease. Truly, if he wanted to get double the money, so therefore it had to be an accident, then being terminally ill is not the way to do that anyway, so I don't even understand. If it's ruled a suicide, the insurance won't pay off. If it's an accident, it's double, double, the double, money. double indemnity. Do we have anybody can talk about cancer? At this point, no. So no nurse, no doctor, what about medical records? No. Wow. No one else knew of Kathy having cancer, and it's a bizarre thing for Earl to lie about, especially because if Kathy killed herself, he wouldn't get any of her insurance money. But we'll have to consider the suicide theory as we examine this case. Okay. How old is Earl now? He is 62 years old. Um, he was released from prison this year. He had served a 60-year sentence for murder wow. of a second wife by the name of Mindy. Hmm. This is the first case we've had where our prime suspect is a convicted killer. Twelve years after Kathy's death, Earl was convicted of murdering his second wife, Mindy, for a life insurance payout and staging her death to look like an accident. And he just got out of prison. How much did he do on a 60 year sentence? 27 years. But a prior conviction alone is never enough to prove guilt in another case. If Earl killed Kathy, we're going to need a lot more evidence. Well, I think we covered all the main points. The goal now is to make sure all the witnesses can truly remember and testify to all these little things, though. Hopefully they're all still around. Some are, some aren't. Ooh. There weren't a whole lot of witnesses even back then. I would say anywhere from 25 to 30. I'm anticipating there will be about five that are deceased, which would leave us with about 20 to 25. If they're all around, we should still be okay. The first on the list would be Sheriff Ted Melvin. He's has passed. Sergeant Brazier has passed. Okay. Dr. Jack Weinbaum. Has passed, too. Has passed. Yeah, passed. Uh, Herman Munch has passed. Mm -hmm. uh, Who else? Um... Sue Orr, Harold Pons, Robert Wilson, Lila Winters, Mary Estes, and then I believe the suspect's father, Russell Taylor, has passed. That's a lot more people than I thought. It's like dominoes. We're finding out that one after another, a lot of our witnesses have passed away. God dog it. This is the first time that I'm honestly worried that we might be too late. Well, that, that hurts. So we're gonna go see Kathy's mom and her sister. Yeah, her dad's passed away. So her mom's gotta probably be up there in age too now, huh? Mm -hmm. Today we're going to meet Kathy's mom and her sister. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. John Motes, I talked to you on the phone. Yes, I saw you Hello. on television. <laughs> After 39 years, I'm sure they realize this will probably be the last time this case will ever be worked on. When all this happened, Kathy was only 23 years old. Kathy was a, a person that loved people and she loved working at a, a nursing home and when she died these people called these old people called and wondered why God didn't take them instead of her because she was so good to them Kathy was a, a kind person and her and her sister got along so well. They played softball together. My girls never did like dolls. She was good at all kinds of sports. Um, we would go bowling, and uh, I always lost. <laughs> but this was a terrible thing. Her doctor is no longer alive, and we can't get the medical records to show that Kathy was a perfectly healthy 23-year-old girl. She was fine. Did she have any kind of cancer? No, oh, no. Nothing at all? No. Kathy's family didn't know anything about this alleged cancer diagnosis, so was she keeping it a secret, or was Earl lying? And if he was, why? They find Kathy on April the 2nd. The weekend before then, do you remember if she had come home to visit y'all? Yes, that was Easter. So she was home Saturday and Sunday, and she left Sunday afternoon to go back to Terre Haute with reservations from us. Reservations, why? We want her to wait. Um, I think we knew that there would be trouble. 
that she was done with the marriage. She was done with the marriage. Even though he got 60 years for Mindy's murder, it doesn't do anything for you, does it? No, oh, I'm sorry, but it didn't. Because why? Because he should have been in prison before that, and then that wouldn't have happened. Mindy would still be alive. Maxine and Bonnie are angry and they're hurt, but they have no doubt that Earl is responsible for Kathy's death. Our goal here, though, is to find the truth, whatever that might be. We're in Vigo County, Indiana, where in 1975, Kathy Taylor was found dead by her husband, Earl. Apparently electrocuted after her radio had fallen into a bathtub. Head west on Cherry Street. So we're trying to figure out whether or not that was an accident, a suicide, or is this a murder? Earl just finished serving 27 years in prison for killing his second wife, Mindy, and staging her murder to look like she accidentally drove herself into a lake. If we're going to figure out if Earl killed Kathy, uncovering patterns in his behavior could be the key. Hello. So we're going to talk to Mindy's sister. Did Mindy know about Earl's first wife when they were uh, together? He had her convinced that he was being harassed, you know, by the authorities, and had Mindy totally convinced that he had nothing to do with it. And so therefore, we were totally convinced he had nothing to do with it. He even took her to, to the gravesite. Did you ever have a conversation with Earl about his first wife's death? No, we don't really know. Other than that she was very similar to Mindy, just a very loving and kind person, and the same scenario with the, the insurance. Mm -hmm. That's a big in common feature. Yes, yeah. yes. Before they were married, he said he was going to be a millionaire by the time he was 30. Before all this happened to Mindy, what, did she ever tell y'all how their marriage was really doing? She didn't me, but she did my mom. Okay. There were times that we saw bruises on Mindy, and then it was probably, I don't know how long before Mindy's death, my mom begged her to leave him and come and live with her. And she didn't want to because of the kids. But he most definitely is a sociopath. He has a way of manipulating a person. He has a way of getting your sympathy. And Mindy was a very loving, caring individual. She loved Earl, and I don't think she saw. She just overlooked all of the signs. We need to find out whether or not Earl displayed any suspicious signs around the time of Kathy's death. Everyone, this is former detective Tom Roberts. I think at one point you were even chief you deputy here. Nice Thank to meet you. you. Tom Roberts was at Kathy's scene that day, so he'll have firsthand knowledge of Earl's behavior. I remember arriving at uh, residence. We walked in. Earl was there. Was he remorseful at all? No. Nothing, eh? And he's so young, you would think he would have been flipping out like any normal 22-year-old would have been. You would think. We didn't get to question Earl too much at that time. But Earl had stated that Kathy had got a call from a neighbor the night before wanting to speak to Kathy. And he advised her that Kathy was in the bathtub and could not answer the phone. Earl told you that? Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. Officer Roberts heard out of Earl's own mouth that Kathy was taking a bath the night before she died. So who takes a bath at night and again the next morning? It doesn't make sense, and it kind of suggests that Earl wasn't being completely honest with the police. Oh, I think I want to kiss you. <laughs> Don't hold back. <laughs> Don't hold back. <laughs> Officer Barnhart also worked the scene at Kathy's house that afternoon and was one of the first to talk to Earl after Kathy's death. I was talking to Earl to find out where he was that day. He told me that uh, Kathy was uh, still in bed when he left and said he got back home at approximately 4.30. He tells you he leaves home. He stops at the Union 76 gas station on North 3rd. Right. And then at Summers Buick at 7.50 a.m. Right. So he told you 7.50 a.m. Right. Every place that he went, he, he gave me a time. Kind of struck me a little bit odd at the time that he remembered the exact times that he was there. It is weird. I don't know. I mean, most people that's, round off. Like, yeah. how about around that's, Spanish? That's the locations yeah. and the times that he gave. Earl went to 14 different places and recalled how long he was there to the minute. Either Earl is a robot or he was overly prepared to explain his whereabouts. 
You gotta love small towns, man. Kathy and Earl's neighbor still lives in the same house she lived in 40 years ago. Let's hope that she can remember that day so she can help us understand what happened. I don't know, I always talk to all the neighbors. I go over and introduce myself and talk to them. And I knew Kathy more than I knew him, but I could see their comings and goings. Of okay. course, I see everybody's coming. Sure, absolutely. Does. You never know what's going on. Exactly. Do you <laughs> remember much about that day? I remember he came home with the dog. He's claimed to have been gone from 7 to 4.30. No, he was not, because okay. he came home. You said back then, around 10 a.m.? That's probably, that could be right. And you saw him drive in? I saw him drive in and get out of the car with the dog, which I thought was weird. Why was it weird? Because I'd just never seen him leave with the dog. Okay. Kathy Smith saw Earl at his house during a time Earl claimed he wasn't at home. How could he meticulously mention 14 different places he went that day down to the minute and not remember to mention that he was at his own house at that particular time? Usually if she was home, the drapes were open. Most of the time, yes. And on the day that she ends up being found, they were closed close. the whole day. Okay. I found it kind of odd that he didn't call the cops right away or come to somebody's house and say, my wife is, you know, my wife is dead. That kind of creeped me out. You know, I just kind of wanted to keep my family away from him. And Well, he is out. Matter of fact, is he around this area? Mm -hmm. He's right here in Terre Haute. Oh, is he? He's working. I just think that was one of those cases that somebody just got away with murder. <laughs> I really do. We're investigating the 1975 death of Kathy Taylor and trying to determine if it was a mere accident like her husband claimed, a suicide, or if it was a murder. This is Kelly Taylor. Kelly. Hey, She's Kelly. working with me on this. Hi. Sue dated Earl just before he married Kathy, and then after he tried to stay in touch with her. She was just 19 at the time, but we're hoping that she can maybe give us some insight into what Earl was like way back then. So when you started dating him in high school, mm -hmm. is that right? Senior year. Mm -hmm. You guys dated for six or seven months, is that right? Yes. When did that relationship end? In the fall of 73, because there was a homecoming game at Terre Haute South, and then we were going to go down to the game. He pulls up behind me, and I said, well, shut the car off and come on in. And he stood there, and he says, I can't. I'm on my way to my wedding rehearsal. Turned around, got in his car. He goes, by the way, I'm sorry. You're kidding. No, I'm not. And that's when Kathy found out about me, and I found out about her. She had no clue we had been dating. And then I wrote her a letter. Well, we I, have it. Okay, good. Read that out loud. Okay. He's been seeing me since the Monday after you were married. He asked me to marry him one week before his wedding. He told me that he told you he didn't love you, but he still loved me. He said before anything happened to you, he'd take out more insurance. Yeah. So we could live quite well. Yep. Sue's letter and testimony is evidence that Earl himself made a direct connection between receiving life insurance and separating from Kathy. So that is another piece of the puzzle that shows us Earl's motive. Why did that affect you so much? He killed her. I'm not stupid. I'm sorry. I just... Probably I had done something then. You did. I didn't do enough. Make it up all right? Yeah. Earl used to sell insurance for a man named James Cora. Maybe he can tell us more about Earl's interest in insurance, professionally and personally. People seem to really like him. Right. But for some reason, I just didn't trust him. One of my secretaries came to me one day. And she laid down about five envelopes using our office address in the name of Kathy. Kathy Taylor. And what they were were uh, life insurance policies that Earl had purchased on her life through mail order uh, life insurance companies. And probably a couple days later, Kathy came in, we met in my office. Obviously she didn't know about them, didn't sign them. It wasn't her signature? Correct. Okay, that they'd been forged? Yeah. James tells us that not only did Earl order multiple life insurance policies on Kathy, but he had forged her signatures and had them delivered to his work to avoid Kathy seeing them. This is big. And I'll never forget these words that she used. She said, I think he's planning on bumping me off. Earl's a cold person. His whole life is a scam. Yeah, it is. Thinks he can get away with anything. And He was young. Learning. Yeah. 
He was young. He's he was just learning. learning his trade. We poked all kinds of holes in Earl's alibi and uncovered his scam having to do with insurance policies. Both of those are great pieces of circumstantial evidence. But to prove a case against him, we need to see if the way Kathy died suggests murder. Dr. Kaur is a forensic pathologist here at the regional hospital. Since the original medical examiner has passed away, Captain Mose has arranged for Dr. Kaur to help us understand how Kathy died. What would you say is your medical opinion that, as far as what you would expect to find if she would have been electrocuted? Electrocution uh, generally stops the heart. That's how it causes death. Yeah. Breathing should stop pretty much instantly, so you should have basically normal occurring lungs. Nevertheless, in this case, we did have edematous lungs. Now, edematous lungs means fluid collection within them. The lungs, in her case, there's a lot of fluid in there. It's, that tells me it's inconsistent with uh, electrocution and consistent with drowning. Even though the original autopsy report didn't rule out electrocution, it's more likely Kathy drowned. That's huge. What we do see in the autopsy is documentation of several small bruises uh, around the face and chin and the inner aspects of the arm. So we're just talking somewhere here. Two here. by two centimeters. Yeah. yeah. Now, if they're well, get two by two, basically, is almost not quite an inch. The bruises on Kathy's arms are suspicious, and they're also about the same size as thumbs. Thumbs that could belong to an assailant who clutched her arms as they held her beneath the bathwater to drown her. What they did notice uh, at autopsy was rigor was no longer present in the large joints, but was still present in the ankles and wrist. Um, that tells me it's been a while. Many factors affect rigor mortis, but typically soon after death, chemical changes in the body cause a gradual stiffening of the muscles, which would put you in full rigor in about 12 hours. Then the process reverses in much the same way, Earl claimed that Kathy was alive when he left the house at 7 a.m., and she was dead when he returned at 4.30 p.m., suggesting that she died taking a morning bath. And when Kathy's coroner arrived, he noticed minor stiffness in her body, which would be consistent with the early stages of rigor, not rigor that had over eight hours to set in. The other issue is when they open the stomach, document the contents. We've got corn and peas. What's in her stomach for her last meal, time-wise, suggests an evening meal and not a breakfast-type meal. Peas and corn sound a lot more like dinner than breakfast. And if you consider that Earl told Detective Roberts that Kathy had taken a bath the night before. Earl told you that? Yes. It seems likely that that's when Kathy actually died, which means her body was at the end stages of rigor. And that means Earl was lying. You didn't see anything that had anything to do with her having any sort of cancer in her body. Uh, Becker Weinbaum, who did the uh, autopsy, was routinely looking for natural disease. So if he had seen cancer, he would have noted that. And the fact that it's not in his report says there's actually no evidence of cancer going on. It's now crystal clear that all of Earl's stories about Kathy having cancer were just that, a bunch of stories. Most likely just to garner sympathy from all the other women in his life. Doc, I got a question for you. And I don't know about the second wife. Second death, yes. Both of them are water related. From medical terms, is there anything that you can think of why someone would choose a water related death multiple times? And this has nothing to do with forensics, but I mean, anything you do, if you've been successful on you know one occasion and you know gotten away with it, why change? Our main suspect, Earl Taylor, just showed up at the sheriff's office. Oh my goodness. I'm wondering if he heard we are reinvestigating the case. But more importantly, what the hell is he doing here? Our main suspect in Kathy Taylor's murder, her husband Earl, just showed up at the sheriff's office. Unfortunately, he wasn't here to confess. He just came to register as a violent offender. So he registered with his current address, phone number, all that kind of stuff? Because right now, we just have the address for where he's living. It's too early for us to question him about Kathy's death, but it's just another frightening reminder that he is back on the streets. Bet he just doesn't have any idea what's coming. Yeah. It's been established that Kathy likely died from drowning and not electrocution which suggests that her accidental death was staged. But we want to look at the other physical evidence to see if it supports that conclusion. This is Kelly. Hello. This is Hi one there. of our detectives, Derek Phil. Next to this Hi. is Mr. Mowbray. Dale Mowbray was the electrician that examined the clock radio that Earl claims fell into the bathtub and killed Kathy. When I took it apart, the power supply was shorted out. You know, it could have gotten wet 
Mainly, they were interested in the electrical cord on it, and it was excessively long. Mr. Mulberry, maybe it would help if you looked at the radio and showed us what you saw. Back in 1975, police purchased a duplicate radio from the manufacturer and compared it to the Taylor's radio. And it was immediately clear to them there was a distinct difference. Okay, here's your brown. Yeah, yeah. this is probably not over six feet. This white one is probably close to 10 feet. That indicated to me that somebody had changed the cord to be excessively long. This part right here, is that typical looking? No. No, the knot. No. This was not the plug that the manufacturer put on. You would have thought he had enough sense to get the same color. Well, that's kind of the big clue is the <laughs> plug is different from the cord, yeah. which it never comes from the manufacturer like no. that. Earl was convicted of murdering his second wife, Mindy, because it was proven that her so-called accidental death was staged. It's gonna be a tight little space, guys. Yeah. It's time we visit the crime scene and try to figure out if Kathy's was too. It'll be interesting to see how that cord fits. Yes, it will. Oh, actually, all of this is the same. Our bathtub, everything is the same, guys. The difference is we'd have to just picture the doors here, okay? The most important thing to understand is the distance between the outlet and the tub. According to Earl, Kathy's radio had accidentally fallen into the bath while it was resting on the edge of the tub. The question is, is that even possible? Okay, so here we have the manufactured radio that the sheriff's office had purchased. This would be the six-foot cord. So that's the standard cord. You're reaching it as far as you can right there. Mm -hmm. It's extended as far as it'll go. I can't pull it any farther. So now let's look at the other one. Now we have the actual radio from evidence back in 1975. Right. You can already see the difference. So we can move it all the way into the And right bathtub. into the bathtub. And you still have plenty cord of excess there. cord. If Earl staged the scene to look like an accident, he clearly had to tamper with the radio cord in order for it to reach the top. And really, what other reason could there be? It makes no sense why Kathy would have wanted something as dangerous as a radio sitting on the edge of her bathtub. Your counter is literally right here. Why would you not just leave your radio plugged in with a normal cord, leave it on the counter? There's one right there in the corner from our new homeowner. You leave it there. It doesn't even make one bit of sense. It just doesn't. This wasn't an accident, and the cause of death wasn't electrocution. It was Earl. The medical examiner does talk about some bruising right on the inside of the arms. I'm kind of thinking pressure points from thumbs. Thumbs are very strong. They're actually the strongest of all of your fingers on your hands, so you're going to add a lot of pressure inside of those arms holding them down. Okay, here comes the trial lawyer here. We're going to do a reenactment. A question we get all the time is how do you prove a murder to a jury? The answer is you show them, but first you have to figure it out. Okay, Yolanda, come get in the tub. Fortunately, Yolanda's a good sport, so she's going to be our victim this time. Okay, so this is what we're going to tell the jury. Steve, you're 6'3", right? right. And, and Earl is 6'3". Right. Okay, you're Earl. Right. She's Kathy. She's in the tub. Remember the bruises on the arms. You show us how you think it happened. So what I'm going to do so I'm going to reach down, I'm going to bend over. He's holding her down here. That's where the bruises are going to come in between the elbow and the shoulder. Her hair is going to get wet because now she's under this eight inches of water. Why can't he just come up to her like this and hold her down? And smashing her head and bruising the chin like this. It could be. It could be. I think they even said the bruise on this arm is darker than the one on this arm because he's pushing more weight this way. Because he's holding his own weight across the bathtub. Okay, pretzel lady, we're going to try the third theory. Okay. You're going to lay face down in the tub. This is how the injuries in the chin could occur. I know, but why would she let him do that? How about this? Does he have to push her head to the side and hold her head to the side to get her underwater? Eight inches up to here. See? Right. You may have to shove oh, her chin to the yeah. side while you're holding here and pushing to get her head under the water to drown her. John nailed it. With the bruises to Kathy's chin, it's likely Earl pushed her face to the side beneath the water until she drowned. He was talking about he pulled her out. How would you have been able to get out with the doors being there? When police arrived, Earl had already removed Kathy from the bath and had set her beside the tub. But given the small space and the sliding doors on the bathtub, it's not natural for him to have placed her there. You pull her towards the hallway. Yeah. You wouldn't pull her into here, yeah. right? Yeah. My theory is he doesn't pull her out of this side. He actually slides it this way. It makes much more sense for Earl to have removed Kathy from the tub and later near the hallway. 
I'm gonna pull her out in an angle and leave her right here because there's more of an area. And since that's not where Kathy was, it suggests something else altogether. Her waist. Yeah, it's like right here. It's right here with this wall. Right. I see her body being positioned where it's at to shut that door. You know, you shut the door He's and forget about it for, for a, a half a day to run all of his errands while so once the door shut. Uh, okay, so watch my hair as this happens. Ready? Yep. Pull you in towards the tub. I'm gonna stop right here. See how the hair falls? There you go. Y'all wanna strategize on how you're gonna approach Earl? I'm torn on whether Earl's is gonna speak to us or not. He's not an emotional guy. You know, he's just gonna be a flatliner. And you're gonna have to go in there, we're gonna have to hit him with just the facts, just a couple of questions. Absolutely. It's time to talk to the person who killed Kathy Taylor, her ex-husband Earl Taylor. Okay, we're good. Earl stopped by the sheriff's department several days ago, but I don't think we're gonna be that lucky today. We're gonna have to go out track him down. Hit the library? Yep. We know that he goes to the library to use the computer because he doesn't have one, so and hopefully we find him there. They were saying he was creeping out the women in the library already. Since he's been out? Yeah, he goes there and hangs out on the computer all day. He does? Yeah, I guess he, what else is he gonna do? Unless he's trying to get close to some woman already. I bet he's scouting him out. Oh, I'm sure he's been out a couple months. No one right here. Hey, hey, we're just trying to find somebody that we heard that was hanging out here. Tall, 6'3", gray hair, older gentleman. You think it's him in here? White shirt, maybe? It's hard to say. You're old Taylor? Yes. Derek Phil, Sheriff's Office, Fico County. How you doing? Good, how you doing? Do you mind talking to me just for a minute? I'd appreciate it. We won't take up too much time, I promise. Earl just spent 27 years in prison. I'm sure he has no intentions of going back. Get cool. Too hot outside. So you probably didn't expect to, for me to walk up to you in the library, did you? Uh, that would be an understatement. We just basically want to talk to you um, about back in 1975 when uh, your first wife, Kathy, was found dead. Okay? I have no comment. Thank you. Good day, Jim. Earl, you've never even been talked to about this. Wouldn't you know Earl's all nice and friendly until you ask him about Kathy? I'm not surprised. God. Man, when I walked up to him, he, I was surprised he even he didn't want to leave the, the computer. That's all right, boys. We didn't need him to say anything. Nope, that's exactly right. He better enjoy that freedom. He ain't going to have it for long. Yeah. When you work on cold cases, you want there to be a day where your evidence is good. And you never want to feel like a suspect has to confess or has to make a stupid news story or even has to talk. You want to have a case to where when you walk up to him and he says, I ain't got nothing to say to you, you're like, that's fine with me. And that's what we have. Out of all the questions we had, we got to zero. <laughs> John, Derek. Save your chips. You'll have a case one day where you need them to talk. And exactly. You get your chips that day. You don't need them today. But look at all that you have up there. Yeah. We now have a great circumstantial evidence case against Earl Taylor for the murder of his wife, Kathy. We learned her cause of death is inconsistent with accidental electrocution, as Earl claimed. Inconsistent with uh, electrocution and consistent with drowning. In examining all the physical evidence, it's pretty clear that the accident was just staged. It's extended as far as it'll go. This six foot cord definitely will not work. We found witnesses who can testify that not only was Earl's alibi manufactured. Every place that he went kind of struck me a little bit odd that he remembered an exact time. But it's just a big old lie. He claimed to have been gone from 7 to 4.30. No, he was not because okay. he came home. And then there's the motive, the multiple life insurance policies that Earl took out, which paid double if it was an accident, forged with Kathy's signature. He's, I think he's planning on bumping me off. I think just looking at that board, it's really obvious that that's a lot of pieces against somebody. I, I think we're good. I think there's more than enough here. Derek? There's definitely no doubt in my mind that we're ready to take it to the prosecutor's office and see what they say. 
We've got a mountain of evidence against Earl. Hopefully we can put him behind bars this time for the rest of his life. So why don't you line up your meeting with Terry Modisette and Rob. Tell them what all you got. We're ready. We built a fantastic case against Earl for the 1975 murder of his wife, Kathy. Right now, we're hoping that the district attorney, Terry Modisette, has the answer that Kathy's family has been waiting for for 39 years. We've looked over the evidence that's been presented, looked over the probable cause statement, and uh, we think there's enough to file murder charges in this case. Oh, that's excellent, awesome. excellent, excellent, excellent. Awesome. You guys gave me some additional information that really, I felt like, kind of put us over the edge. Can I shake your hand? <laughs> and wish you good luck, and wish you good luck. Thank you so much. I'm going to get a piece of paper go pick somebody up. <laughs> it's a win. It's just a perfect win because here's something that a lot of people have just given up on. Don't expect anything's going to happen with it. Everybody put their heart into it, and we get charges filed. It's a great feeling on this one. Earl Taylor, like most human beings, is a creature of habit, and we're going to go back to the library and check for him, and hopefully we find him there. Got eyes on? I'll tell you exactly what he's wearing. Blue t-shirt, black ball cap, black slacks. Earl Taylor? Give me the rest. I'm going to run Taylor. Can you turn your back? Kathy Taylor is the kind of victim you go into law enforcement to help. And if you decide you want to be a cop like Derek and John, there's never a more important case you're going to work on than one like this. You're never going to get more satisfaction, and you're never going to get more justice than taking a murderer like Earl Taylor off the streets of your county. Morning, ladies. Glad to see y'all again. Glad to see you, too. See you. We got goodies. He needs to share it with you, okay? He's not going to share it. <laughs> Maxine and Bonnie have been praying for this day to come, and it feels great to be part of a team to let them know the day is here. We've had a productive week. Our team has been able to put a lot of pieces to this puzzle together, and we've arrested Earl. Uh, he's going to go to jail for the murder of Kathy. Praise the Lord. Been a long time coming. I don't know how to thank you. You don't need to thank us. This case is strong enough now with all the witnesses that they found that if it goes to trial and he gets convicted and he goes to prison again, he's not getting out until he dies. Good. It's something that you waited for for so long. For him to pay for what he's done to my daughter. This is a happy day for me. Thank you, bud. Oh, Bonnie, you keep praying. I will. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much for having trust in us. I'm very, very happy for you. I really feel you. It's wonderful. It's all going to be okay now. I appreciate it. Okay, so I'm thank happy you. for you guys. Thank you. Great satisfaction because they've been waiting for 39 years. That's longer than I've been alive. We see. We finally got it. <laughs> Kathy Taylor deserved justice. Her family deserves justice. And now they're finally going to have it. Maybe lightning really does strike twice. As part of an ongoing review of cold cases here at the Sheriff's Office, we recently reopened the Kathy Dean Taylor death investigation. It's been a lot of years. A lot of years. We're determined to bring justice and today, that's what we have done. Mm -hmm. 